Hill Baptist Church today. We are grateful that we are able to gather together, even virtually, to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ together. We have a few announcements that I would like to, to make this morning to remind you of some things. Once again, hope you enjoyed Sunday school time this morning, and there's many options for you there. If you would like to join a Sunday school class, just contact the church, and we'd love to get you to connect it to one of those Sunday school classes. We also have a women's Bible study meeting every Sunday night. Uh, Carol Harsh uh, facilitates this uh, each Sunday night at 5 p.m. They're currently studying the book of Thessalonians, First and Second Thessalonians. Uh, each Tuesday night, uh, we have preschoolers who meet at 5 p.m. Now, this week they will not meet because of our virtual Bible school, but each other Tuesday, preschoolers meet at 5 p.m. If you would like to be invited to that, if you're not already, please uh, let Sarah Boberg know. Uh, on Wednesday nights, our children and our adults uh, typically meet, but this week, uh, again, our children are not meeting. Uh, they meet at 6 usually, but they're not meeting the month of July. But our adults will be meeting at 7 p.m. Uh, this Wednesday evening as Dr. Tony Cartledge is going to continue, continue his study in the book of Genesis. Uh, this time uh, he will uh, help us uh, understand more about the story of Jacob. So please uh, join us this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Uh, the youth are, are meeting each Sunday morning for Sunday school, and they're going to begin meeting soon. Uh, this week, uh, they're going to meet for our virtual Bible school. So if you would like to reach out to John, uh, he would love to get you information about 
uh, the youth meeting for virtual Bible school and uh, what their plans are during this week as well. And they will begin meeting on Sunday nights again soon. Also, during the month of July, we've uh, been providing a staycation calendar with many different activities during the week. And I know many of you have been enjoying those opportunities. Uh, Check it out. It's in your Connect, and you can look into that and see what we are doing each and every day. Uh, Once again, our our ministries of the church are going well that we are participating in. Uh, I did want to let you know that the Accord groups are meeting in the church again, as um, the deacons had decided uh, when we first uh, stopped meeting together in the building that they could meet as long as they wanted, and and I've had a few people ask. They they are meeting uh, in their usual times, in the usual space, but that's the only group meeting in the church right now. Uh, But uh, the ministries, other ministries and opportunities we have in the church are going well, food distribution, laundry ministry, and others. And so we thank you for your support of those. And we look forward to the days ahead where maybe more uh, groups and ministries and opportunities will present themselves to us. Um, Last Sunday, we had a business meeting and we approved a few things. We uh, approved uh, the deacon slate that had been set forth uh, a few months ago for us and we Uh, got those individuals elected, and uh, we we thank those deacons for their willingness to serve, Um, especially uh, Doug Jenkins and Wayne Harding, who will need to be ordained in the days ahead. And uh, we're going to have a special word of prayer for them this morning during our service. But uh, we will at some point in the days to come, maybe when we can gather again, have a proper ordination service for Wayne Harding and Doug Jenkins, and we look forward to that. We also approved a couple of nominating committee uh, updates that we needed to make concerning some of our committees. And then we also approved um, the expenditure of some money as well as the uh, ability to collect money to go to uh, upgrading and and buying some audio-visual equipment for the church. And uh, if you are willing uh, to give to that, we invite you to do so. Just earmark your monies to audiovisual, and we will put that money aside as we look to purchasing cameras and sound equipment and other things in order to uh, help us as we look forward to the days where we can gather again in the sanctuary. And, and we know things are going to be different uh, in those coming days, and we need to provide multiple options for people who meet here physically together, but also are away. And if you would like to be a part of that and give to that, we encourage you to do so. But as always, I I encourage you um, to make it an offering uh, above and beyond your tithe. We uh, need to be faithful to the giving of the the total ministry of the church in our tithes. And if if you have some extra that you would like to give to the audiovisual equipment and work that needs to be done, we invite you to consider that. But we thank you for your generosity and your willingness to continue to give to the church. It's, it's been wonderful to see uh, all your generosity, and we look forward to your giving and all that we can do together, uh, of not just of your finances, but of your, of your time and resources and energy as well. And as always, check out your Connect each uh, Tuesday and Friday. It's been going out uh, for you to see and know what is going on in the life of the church. Um, God bless you now. May we join our hearts together in worship on this day. Last Sunday, we officially elected Kirk Bean, Wayne Harding, Gene Hutchinson, Doug Jenkins, and Jamie Luckett to serve as deacons. This is the first time that Wayne Harding and Doug Jenkins have been elected to serve, and we look forward to a time in which we can have an ordination service for them. However, today I would like to take this opportunity to say a special prayer of blessing over these two as they start this new journey and the entire deacon board as they guide the church in the days ahead. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the work that you are doing through Ox Hill Baptist Church. We thank you for the leadership that you have provided us especially the leadership we find in the deacon board. Lord, we lift up the deacon board to you. Kirk Bean, Wayne Harding, Gene Hutchinson, Doug Jenkins, Jamie Luckett, 
Joanne Hendricks, Carol Harsh, John Edwards, Mary Peterson, Allison Majette, Kim Scottsko, and Kim Kirby. For each of these, Lord, you have placed for such a time as this. For us to be led by these individuals, we give you thanks. We ask that you guide them and direct them in the days ahead as they look forward to the days in which we can gather again, meet in person again, and have an opportunity, Lord, for us to continue to grow together. May you guide them as they make decisions to facilitate these needs. May you also provide, Lord, for them uh, strength and perseverance as we know that these decisions are difficult. We pray especially for Doug Jenkins and Wayne Harding, as this is the first time they have ever had an opportunity to serve as a deacon. Lord, we lift them to you. We say thank you for providing them to us, their leadership, their direction, their thoughts. We ask that you help them in their spiritual life grow closer to you, connecting with you, connecting with others, and ultimately providing sound decisions and guidance. Lord, we ask and pray that as we set apart Wayne Harding and Doug Jenkins for this service of deacon, that you will bless them, strengthen them, and encourage them. Be with their families as they support them in this service. And allow them to know, Lord, that you are there with them. So thank you for Doug. Thank you for Wayne. May they be blessed as they provide a blessing to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, we have gathered to worship, and once again, we begin our time by lifting our voices in praise as we celebrate God's greatness and his goodness as we sing together the familiar hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Morning, Oxville Baptist Church. It's good to see you this morning. You pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace this morning to humble ourselves in your majestic presence and offer this prayer. We ask that you forgive us when we fail you and guide us when we stray from your teachings. We thank you for always loving us and for walking with us wherever we go and for caring about the smallest details of our lives. Please open our hearts and minds as we hear your words today, instructing us to be obedient to your commands and directing us not to run away from you as Jonah did. Please give us the strength, courage, and humility to go wherever you lead us. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, sorry, just give me, just give me one minute. I've got to check this Facebook. Then I've got to...
check the Instagram. Oh, yeah. Nice. I got to check the TikTok. Just give me, hold on one second. God, just, you're, you're cool, right? We're good. Okay, good. Got to check the TikTok. See if there's any new videos out. Oh, nice. Okay, let me check my email. Just, just, what, just, I, I'll be right with you. Be right with you. Emails. I have two, I, I actually have three emails. So just, just, hold on. You're good, right? It's fine. It's fine. It's fine, God. It's fine. Okay. Oh, I'm really sorry. Sometimes I get a little obsessed with this smartphone. Do you know what obsessed means? It means like you can't keep your mind off of it. It's all you think about. It's all you want to do. Sometimes, confession time, Miss Sarah gets obsessed with her phone, checking all the social media, checking my email, make sure I have all my stuff checked off of my to-do list for the day. I get a little obsessed. And when I do, I don't pay attention to anything else. I didn't pay attention to you. I certainly wasn't paying attention to God and the fact that he wanted me to get along with his children sermon. So sometimes we get obsessed with things and it keeps us from doing what God wants us to do. I was so obsessed with checking all my social media on my smartphone that I couldn't get started with the children's sermon, which I'm sure God would rather me do than stay on my phone. Today, Pastor Brad is going to talk about Jonah. Now, most of you know that Jonah was swallowed by a big fish because he was on his way to Nineveh and he didn't want to go to Nineveh. Well, guess what? Jonah was obsessed. He was obsessed with not wanting to go to Nineveh. He was obsessed with talking about how the Ninevites were evil and horrible. And he was so obsessed with not wanting to go to Nineveh that he was paying no attention to what God wanted. And in the end, he still went to Nineveh. So we can learn a little bit from Jonah and that we don't need to be obsessed with things so much that we forget to pay attention to God. Because when we fill our lives with all of these things, we can't hear and we can't see what God is doing. So I encourage you today to put down something that you might be obsessed with or might take a lot of your time. So maybe it's your smartphone or your tablet or your Nintendo DS or maybe even that book you won't put down to spend time with God. Or maybe you're obsessed with playing and working out or um, riding your bike so much that you don't spend time with God. Whatever it is, I invite you to put it down for just a few minutes and spend some time with God and see where God is at. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you that you are always with us and always present. Lord, we're sorry that we get obsessed with things and forget to see you and hear you. Lord, help us to listen, help us to obey, and help us to follow you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Today I will be reading Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 and 10. Hear the word of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Now verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Every 
Doug Fishbone is his name. He grew up in New York and aspired to be a doctor, but after watching MASH and having some bad dreams, he decided that was not for him. He went on to be a music major in college, but really that didn't go far either. Uh, He then became a salesman and sold different goods and even lived in Israel for a little while selling fabric. But Doug Fishbone found himself operating in a next net loss each year. He then got a job in the financial field, but that was just to get by. It wasn't until beginning art classes in his 30s that Doug Fishbone really found his passion. After relocating to Ecuador and seeing all the bronze and clay sculptures, he had an idea. As a publicity stunt for the opening of a a bank, he was going to make a banana sculpture to entice people to come to the bank opening. Now, I personally believe the word sculpture is a little loosely defined in this case because this banana sculpture, to me, was more just like a big pile of bananas than anything of a sculpture. He borrowed a a metal amateur from, from a local blacksmith, and he piled hundreds of bananas in it and 
stayed outside of the bank and people came by and saw the bananas and they even allowed people to take bananas. Uh, And many filled up carts and bags and took the bananas home. It was a truckload of bananas in the middle of a square and he called it a banana sculpture. It wasn't the last one he would make either. He'd go on to make several of these. And it became who he was, the the banana sculptor. People came and would look at these sculptures and take pictures with them. Uh, Several years ago, he... Uh, moved to London, and he decided uh, to to in the uh, Trafalgar uh, Square in London dump thirty thousand bananas in the square, and he called it art. Another ban- banana sculpture. Um, you can say that being a banana sculptor was his obsession. Now, you and I can sit here this morning and scratch our heads and wonder what in the world's going through this guy's mind. Uh, dumping bananas somewhere and calling it art, you know, well, I guess beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It was an obsession that it really became for Doug Fishbone. Banana sculptures. It's what drives somebody. Obsession is what drives somebody to build these huge banana sculptures or or maybe to attempt to cross over all the world's suspension bridge. Uh, Susan Sheehan and Howard Means uh, regale their, their readers and with stories of these offbeat pursuits in their book called The Banana Sculptor, The Purple Lady, and The All-Night Swimmer. They tell 40 stories uh, in this book about people's obsessions, including the story of Peter Holden, who is in, attempting to eat at all 3,000 plus McDonald's in the United States. Or, or the young woman who turns a passion in baking into winning over 3,000 ribbons in the huge Iowa state. Fair. People are passionate about the strangest things. These authors interview each of these individuals and discover their motivations and even their consequences to these strange obsessions. Uh, Jim Dreyer, whose aim is to swim across each of the Great Lakes admits that his goals don't permit him to have a family or really much of social life at all. But he seems genuinely satisfied with his purpose in life, to swim across all the Great Lakes. Uh, A New York City man uh, ferrets out the origins of words and phrases such as his hometown becoming known as the Big Apple. People's obsessions lead them to all sorts of ideas and pursuits. But where would Jonah fit in this collection of odd individuals, we may call them? These obsessive compulsives. Just like them, Jonah has an obsession. Perhaps a passion we would say is a better word. And it's a passion that would lead him to direct disobedience to the will of God. It's an obsession that endangers the lives of others. It's a stubbornness that would withhold the grace of God to a repentant people. It's a passion as strong as anyone's hunger to collect antique postcards Uh, books by uh, a a rare author, uh, to collect pre-canceled stamps or marbles or spy memorabilia or Indo-Chinese military medals. Jonah's passion, his obsession, his idol, we may say, was his patriotism. Now I know that immediately ruffled some of your feathers and The hair stood up on the back of your neck. What do you mean, 
patriotism. Well, let's look at Jonah. Let's look at the time period. Let's look at his life. See, Jonah knows, just like all the other people of Israel, that, that the people of Nineveh were evil people and that they were expecting one day for the hammer that is Nineveh to come down and crush the people of Israel. So he, just like many others, was taught from an early age that Nineveh was full of terrible, terrible, evil, wicked human beings. And those human beings hated the people of Israel. And the nation of Israel was to never help the people of Nineveh. Uh, the, the nation of Israel was, was to never look out for the good of the people of Nineveh. It was something that was taught and bred within him to, to really his, his, uh, be hateful towards the people of Nineveh because of how terrible they were. I'm sure he was taught all their evil deeds and was told all the terrible things about the people of Nineveh. And so he believed so strongly. He was obsessed and taken so uh, strongly by his belief, by his love of Israel and his hate for Nineveh. Even when God tells him to go preach hell, fire, and brimstone to the people of Nineveh, he refused. He had been taught to hate Nineveh so much that they didn't even deserve to hear any word from God. So Jonah, instead of going to Baghdad to tell Saddam Hussein about the love of God or go to Afghanistan to preach to the Taliban or, uh, or, or, or getting in a, a plane or a ship or a car and, and going on up to Pyongyang and share the news of God with Kim Jong-un, he skipped town and he headed down to Tarshish, determined to flee the presence of the Lord. He allowed his passion of hate, his obsession with Israel first, to get in the way of God's call on his life. He had been taught something that he believed so strongly in. He was unwilling to change his belief to meet up with the God he was encountering. First question I want to ask you today, church, is what belief, what obsession, what idol is preventing you from being obedient to God? Now, I know for many of us, we, we struggle. There's a lot of things in life we like. Some of us like being right and therefore thinking that we may be wrong about something, you know, it gets in our way. We like stuff. We like people. And often it gets in our way. Is success calling your name? Is money your primary obsession? Are you a foodie and therefore you can't go to a place God is calling you to do because of the food that they serve? Uh, do you like your creature comfort so much you're unwilling to follow? Is your safety and security more important to you than your God? Now, I am not calling you and I want to be clear about this. I am not calling you to be foolish and just do whatever. I'm calling you to be obedient and do whatever God wants you to do. Many of us are unwilling to go to Nineveh, our Ninevehs, because just like Jonah, we have been taught and now we believe that there is something in our lives more important than telling the Ninevites the good news 
of God, let alone any news of God. But the story progresses. And see, as the story goes on, we find out that Nineveh, uh, excuse me, that Jonah hops in a boat after running. He jumps on the boat, travels in a storm, voluntarily has himself thrown overboard, uh, eaten by a large fish, sits there for a few days. He did all of that, run, jump, sail, storm, thrown overboard, and sit in the giant fish in order to avoid telling the news of God to the people of Nineveh. Think about it. Jonah would rather die than go to Nineveh. That's some serious obsession of hate and disdain towards people. I don't know about you, but that sounds very counter to the God that I believe in. Jonah's hate, his disdain, his belief that he was better than somebody else prevented him from being obedient. So after sitting there in this large fish for a few days, He reluctantly agrees to go. He spit out on the land. And really, I think the only reason Jonah agreed to go is because he can't even kill himself to get out of it. God asked him to go to Nineveh again in chapter 3. He takes that three-day journey to Nineveh, probably kicking and screaming the whole way there, complaining to God and telling God why God is wrong to make him do this. And he arrives in Nineveh and says eight words. Well, at least it's only eight words in the English language. That's all Jonah says, eight words. And this is what he says. Forty more days... And Nineveh will be destroyed. And and the people of Nineveh believe in God. They repent. They fast. Something many of you have never been willing to do. And they turn from their evil ways. Even the king turns and puts on a sackcloth and repents. And God relents. He has compassion and forgives the people of Nineveh. What a mighty God we serve. What a compassionate and loving God that we have. And this is worth celebrating. That the most evil, rotten scoundrels in the world can be forgiven. That God loves them enough to forgive them and to embrace them and to accept them into God's very own arms. Think that God loved the people of Nineveh so much he was worth it was worth him doing all that God did for Jonah in order for them to hear the news of God. God loved the people of Nineveh so much he was willing to spare their lives. That's really big news. I imagine some singing and clapping going on in heaven. There's some praise in the Lord that's happening. I, I, I imagine maybe a parade takes place. Some bells are ringing and, and Jonah w- w- could have been honored to take part in such an extraordinary work of God. But no. Jonah pouted. See, even after being obedient to God, Jonah would not relent on his obsession. 
He would not allow his passion, his obsession, his belief to get out of the way in order for him to be compassionate to the people of Nineveh. He pouted. And he said, and I quote, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to do in forestalling all of this by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew, listen how petty this sounds. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah was angry at God because God was compassionate and loving. Oh, how foolish that sounds. See, church, today, I want you to hear these words. If you are going to err, err on the side of grace and love. Otherwise, we probably end up looking like Jonah. Now, maybe Jonah... And the rest of us are probably more like my one-year-old daughter Lydia than we care to admit. Because in Jonah's pettiness, he sounded just like my one-year-old daughter. You know, you know how it is to be one. You ask for, for milk and I give her milk and she throws a fit because it's in the wrong cup. Uh, she asks for applesauce and I give her applesauce and she throws a fit because she wanted to eat the applesauce in my chair, not hers. Uh, she wants a baby doll and I go and get her a baby doll and she throws a fit because I did not grab the correct baby doll that she wanted. And, and heaven forbid that I get myself something to drink or, or, or a snack to consume myself without giving her one too. Uh, you get my drift? But you and I are more like a one-year-old child than we care to admit because our pettiness is just often like that of Jonah's. And to be honest with you, some of you, your pettiness is probably sitting in your way this morning and listening to this sermon. I know for myself, my pettiness gets in the way far too often, far more often than I want to admit. You know, I look at somebody else and I say, well, I've given my life to the Lord and this is what I get. You know, that person over there, they're, they're evil, they're mean, they're wrong. And look, look at all the money they make. Hear how poorly I sing. And that person over there, they, they singing about all that stuff that they shouldn't be singing about and they making millions off of it. If I were to sing, I'd sing for the Lord. Like I'd, like I'd really sing for the Lord. I'd probably be down there singing songs about things I shouldn't be singing about too. See, we let our pettiness get in the way. Some of you say, well, I'm not an envious person. I, I'm not petty. I don't. Look, I, I, I want you to search deep in your soul and ask yourself, what is it? What is your passion? What is your obsession? What is, what is your pettiness that gets in the way of you serving the Lord the way you should? Because I promise you there is something. I wonder how many of us have been called to be missionaries and we have refused because of the comforts of our lives would get in the way of our willingness to serve a God who's called us to be a missionary. I wonder how many of you have been called to work on behalf of the church, but you're unwilling to work on behalf of the church because you won't make enough money. I wonder how many of you have been called to volunteer to do something and you say, well, it's not worth my time. My time is more valuable somewhere else. I wonder how many of you have been called by God to be obedient and yet you have come up with an excuse not to do it. How many of us are just downright petty when it comes to the work of God? 
When God or the agents of God don't do it our way, we get angry. You know, I was once told that my greatest fault in life was that I see the good in people. I'll say that again because it's an actual quote of somebody. I was once told that my greatest fault was that I see the good in people. Well, I tell you today that I am grateful for the God in heaven who sees the good in me and is willing to love me and care for me. And I'm grateful for a God that thinks I am worth love and care and that I am worth the salvation of Jesus Christ. And hear me today say this, church, you too are worth the love and care and salvation of Jesus Christ. And it is time for us to get out of our own way and set our passions, obsessions, and stubbornness aside and let God work in us and through us. It is not about me. It is not about you. It is about God. And God has a world ripe and ready to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Today, will you travel with me to your personal Nineveh? Will you stop running and jumping on ships and traveling through storms away from God to get to Tarshish and just be obedient. Make God's passion your passion. And in doing so, the love and compassion of God will permeate from your soul. Now that sounds like something worth being passionate about. Amen and amen. What is it in your life that sometimes gets in the way of your relationship with God? What prevents you from being able to say, have thine own way, Lord? As we sing our closing hymn this morning, I encourage each of us to look within ourselves and then allow the Holy Spirit to fill our lives so when others look at us, they will see Christ only always living in me.
and now as you go. May you not allow anything to get in your way of being obedient to God. And may your passion be exactly what God's passion is. And on this journey, on this path of obedience, may Christ go before you, come behind you, and reside within you from now till forevermore. And now let us pray the prayer that our Savior Jesus Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Welcome to Virtual Bible School at Box Hill Baptist Church.